So um, we will have uh, risk associated to our network related to the security risk through the risk assessment. We have to do that, but people, technology, and malware and this are the security risk to the network. Uh, use physical security to prevent and detect uh, intrusions. And this you will learn a lot about in your course, uh, Cybersecurity Essentials. Um, and some of the content might be repeated in the other courses as well. But it's a, it's a good to know as a starter's point here where we are talking about all this um, security issues related to the network. Implement uh, device hardening techniques and explain how the security policies uh, guide activities on the network. So sometimes uh, the employees uh, don't like uh, security policy policies that are in place, but they are there for the reason. And no matter how uh, people react to that, uh, like uh, there's sometimes like the retention policy of Microsoft Teams messages, or sometimes um, due to the privacy concerns, like say, let's say in the healthcare industry, you will have different challenges that you have to face. So because of the people private data and whatnot. So uh, all these activities are monitored uh, in some situations, in some scenario, in some environments, and they are there for the reason if people think that they are not able to use certain browser, um, it is because they uh, it's the, uh, the they, they, they know that there are some software threats available in that browser. So that's why the that's, uh, browser is not used because sometimes it is, People use it day to day at their home, but finding it out that it's not available at the workplace kind of uh, frustrates them. But again, you have to adhere to the policies. Not everything can be explained to the people when they are using those, um, adhering those policies. Um, <clears throat> security risk associated, number one, is the hackers. They are originally uh, meant. Uh, someone who masters the inner working of the computer hardware and software in an effort to better the network, but um, like a technical issue or resolver. But today's hackers are are more uh, inclined towards gain access to unauthorized, uh, actually unauthorized access to the information that they shouldn't have access to. Um, there are three categories that are defined for those hackers, white hat hackers. They are uh proceeding this as a carrier and they are going in the companies and identifying the vulnerabilities and patching up those vulnerabilities so that um uh, so that the company is well prepared for an, any upcoming like, attack and attacks are not um new to the organizations now that we hear it all the time and uh, different universities data banking information you know, all those uh, are pretty easy, like one step away sometimes when you think about it. Um, so uh, th that's why white hacker hackers comes in to put a initial plan of what you will, what you can do to mitigate those risks. Uh, black hack hat hackers uh, on the other side are those who are professionally doing uh, <clears throat> the hacking and they're um, their 24-7 job, instead of saying 9 to 5, their 24-7 job is to um, cause the damage, steal the data, and compromise the privacy. Causing the damage, meaning if uh, uh, changing changing the data or changing the data in such a way that it becomes malicious and non trustable so that can cause the damage to the data, damage to the, uh, the hardware itself, so that they can probably upgrade the upgrade or downgrade the dry, uh, the device so they can easily get into it because you know sometimes devices have patches not uh, up to date so they, they they run some kind of scans and they find out which hardware has not currently been up to date so they can uh, run a good scan and they find out which area or which uh, part of the which uh, part of the country or a province or the part of the world where we have most devices which are not uh, which are not updated or don't have the updated version of the operating system, so they can target those. Steal the data, um, so they can uh, sell that data. Stealing the data com com comes with uh, you know credit card information and whatnot, and compromise the privacy. 
of some information being leaked out on the black web. Uh, and then the gray hat hackers who are who have uh, who have uh, who have seen the best of both worlds. So they are they have pretended to be at some point in time they have been as a white hat hacker, but at the same time they can be a black black hat hackers and they knowing the capabilities of both of them, so they can try. Uh, uh, so you know. It's like a three. Uh, it's a uh, white hat hacker are playing at your defense. Black hat hacker, the other team or the uh, other team that you're trying to that is trying that is trying to make a goal. And uh, gray hat hackers, I would say, the black sheep's in that they can change in their uh, roles that if they want to. Now vulnerability is the is the weakness in the system, which. They, the hackers are after. They always look for the weaknesses because they, obviously, you know, their time to time the patches come out on the on the softwares, and if you don't update those patches, you 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 might run into issues. But sometimes, you know, patches fix one issues. They might cause another issues. Just like I was using um, some softwares in the past, which I was able to use it very freely and no with no problem. Now you have put the security to fix that vulnerability, then it, it has stopped the way the software is working. And then it adds to the frustration because you you are expecting it to behave in a certain manner and it's not it stops behaving. So that can stop a lot of business activity as well. So business uh, vulnerability have fixes, uh, but fixing fixing those vulnerabilities can cause some other side effects or side issues. Exploitation is the act of taking the advantage of that vulnerability. You you know that you can exploit that part uh, of the software which has some lapses in it. You will run some, uh, you will send out the packets, some malicious data packets through that, and the exploitation responds to it in a positive. If it responds to it in a positive manner, you keep digging the rabbit hole, and you can exploit that and particularly at some point you are actually sitting in that network and ready to launch the attack. Um, again, uh, this causes the zero day exploit or zero day attack is the one is the day when is the day when they have set you set the target up, maybe have sent the target a malicious link. Um, the even if it has been identified, by the IT team at the uh, at the at the uh, at the defenders end that this could be a possible problem. They have ran some scans and antivirus, but obviously, what you can do if there is no cure to that exploitation yet, so you are sitting vulnerable, and that exploitation can occur, and someday they can launch the attack, and they can. I can uh, easily remember the wanna try virus or crypto locker um, attacks that has been launched uh, back in 2014 when uh, 2013 and 14 era when at that time crypto locker was just a buzzword at that time and they um, sent out the links to people and people were not aware to even click that link or not. And once they do, they they can encrypt files like twenty thousand files per, I don't know, uh, in within ten fifteen minutes, uh, over the network, and then those files, and then they will ask for that ransomware money or ransomware uh, for unencrypting that, and then they are asking the money based on the Bitcoin or some cryptocurrency based, um, so that they cannot be identified from where they are attacking, but, and they lock the data and. They promise to return the data back, but who knows they will return the data back because they're, they're, it is all encrypted and they have the key. And if you ask for the key, it's up to them to provide them the key, even if you provide them with some and some Bitcoin money. So, you know, keeping the day in the mind that this can happen and in any, so you have to choose your software very delicately. That's why sometimes people, when they get frustrated that these, this is a software that I use daily at home, but your home is a different commodity. You are dealing here at the work, so you should not be using that software or not be asking for that browser if it is 
um, it has certain vulnerabilities that is not fixed or can cause issues. Keep in mind the malicious uh, and determined intruders may use one of those techniques, which then allows them to uh, use the second technique. And you know, as I was mentioning about the rabbit hole, they can go, they can launch the series after series, like they attack that the, the, they they can wait for few days even to launch an attack just to make sure that everything is in place for them to launch the attack also. So how can this be done? Uh, it can be the breaches can be done through the human errors. Obviously, this could be the biggest issue. So you have to choose your technological or any people who are touching the computer based uh, areas like accounting and um, at least for accounting and IT could be very watchful on those. This could be a human error or ignorance and omission. So things that we don't think that could be a, a potential vulnerability could become a vulnerability. Social engineering, which you will learn again in um, cybersecurity and essential course. There are a few that I'm going to mention right now. Uh, the social engineering attacks like pissing, baiting, uh, quit pro queue, do, do something for uh, Ask something for doing something, tailgating, um, going behind some uh, legitimate data packets and induce some, um, and uh, without knowing, without uh, without letting the network know that there is a malicious packet coming behind the tailgated package. Can it's not like the data is traveling at a faster speed that you can stop it at the door. That's why the firewalls are there. But if the packet is already in there with through some malicious links or something like that, what you can do? You can't stop with a firewall. Piggybacking doesn't happen too often, but you can still, on a legitimate data, you can piggyback. And then shoulder surfing, you just stand next to somebody and look for what numbers and pins and password that they are getting. So these are all the social engineerings. We'll look into a little bit again. So the phishing is like uh, sending out the phishing email and a sniff. Uh, if the if somebody and hoping that somebody clicked with that malicious link, baiting you will just uh, um, <clears throat> looking for somebody to go on the website uh, and then uh, on a certain page that malicious code activates itself and then run on and run on the client side. So that could be a problem. Uh, then you can have somebody internally working for you saying that, hey, if you can bring me some information from inside of the company, I can um, I can give you such and such reward. And then you will have a quid pro queue happening, uh, tailgating, as I mentioned. Uh, so uh, you are piggybacking the uh, malicious packet behind the legitimate packet. And The most important uh, defense against social engineering is the employee training. Um, when I go to companies now, or if I give an interview and I'm joining the company, the first training they give me is uh, uh, cybersecurity training. So that not to click on the link, not to share any internal company link to the outside world, you know, exposing those because uh, you can become an insider threat. If not knowingly, you can share something that you, you shouldn't have and then once you show once you have it's a it becomes a problem a bigger problem for the company to resolve that issue because not just changing the administrator password or some different passwords you can guarantee that you are you are out of the threat zone you will still be in the threat zone so you will have that issues so but you cannot shut down the network because the business has to run there's a, uh, there's people data there, which they are using daily, uh, and it's their assets that can be at, at at stake. So whatever they have purchased, or you know, so the, the these are the different threats that all the companies faces. So even if I I am just I used to get um, for myself I used to get Amazon uh, or PayPal links, um, but usually what I do with the first thing that is that 
uh, on my personal email and I usually the first thing I I check even though it says that uh, a link from PayPal or somebody uh, pretending to be PayPal or Amazon I used to first uh, don't believe them because uh, if it is from legitimately from them the email address is the first thing that I go and check because email address could have some garbage data or some garbage garbage email in it um, so the first thing if you don't trust that email address then don't bother about it and you can identify by looking at the email just um, by looking at that uh, that it's not a legitimate email but the other thing is now I just recently got last week uh, uh, an email from support at amazon.com I thought it should be a legitimate email and it was looks like a legitimate email but I didn't click the link instead I called Amazon directly and then I called them and asked them is this the one that I just get an email at this this such and such time from you or that my account is getting blocked or whatever and they denied that so uh, just recently happened to me so I'm just letting you know that even from the legitimate emails looks like you can have uh, inappropriate links that you can click so just to make sure just call them if it is looks a legitimate email from them so if they the, the, the more we are running into the security network security is issues or cyber security issues we need to keep verifying if it's from the legitimate and uh, if it's something related to the money matters i always suggest that you guys verify that part enforce the principle of least privileges meaning that start with the basic level of security don't give everyone everything meaning that if you are handing out the laptop to the employee, hand it with the standard user account. Because sometimes if you give a laptop to the employee with some administrative privilege on that laptop, what actually is is that it makes a life a little easier on the on the administrators because if you give a fully functional administrative device to them so that they can install the software on it, it makes a life a little easier on the part such that if there is any update or Adobe Flash update or Adobe Reader update has came, then administrator does not have to go to individual computer. Administrator would say that just go on to this uh, link and accept it and install it. The installation privilege should only be given to the administrator. But I know sometimes administrators do give out that permissions to uh, ordinary staff so that they can just guide them and say that, yes, just go and upgrade and it will install. But the bad part about it is, is that because you have given the privileges more than they, ex they are expected to, any malicious software if they have accidentally clicked or has been residing on that computer if they click on it then it can potentially run in the background and when they will connect to the network through vpn they will bring that virus into your network right so if they are remotely you are lazy administrator is feeling lazy that who should go and remotely do an update just ask the employee to do that but because you have given the most privileges your employee was able to upgrade that software patch but behind the scene he may have clicked on some other link which he shouldn't and that has become the problem so start with the least privilege and take the responsibility of what job is, is being assigned to you and do that job by yourself instead of asking employee to just go and upgrade by themselves so start with the least privilege and don't give them all the privileges they don't need Design check and balances on the employee behavior. How they are performing, like it's just more of an HR topic. Uh, deploy data loss prevention, or I, I would say it disaster recovery plan, because if the data is lost and you are and data becomes untrustable, or you are missing some client's information, how you can trust that the rest of the information is is credible so the credibility of the data comes with the, the credibility of, uh, of uh, 
of even one row, even one of the customer's data is missing, gone missing, you can question that what, what happens to the 99.9% .9 of the other employees, even though that data might be correct. But, you know, in the mission critical environments, if you lost 10 records or 10% of your data, you can you cannot uh, trust the rest of the data. So your data should be the source of your truth. And the only way you can do it if you have the disaster recovery plan or disaster data loss prevention so that even if it so data should not be lost at any point the solution that identifies the sensitive data and prevent it from being copied or transmitted off the network so it should not be available to everybody if somebody hacks or somebody stole the laptop sitting on your uh, back seat or if a car is stolen and the laptop of the company goes with it uh, the if it if it is if it has been cracked or somebody get access to that data your sensitive data is much important so you should be able to lock that device right there and you know the phones have that laptops should have that once they are powered up the cost of the laptop is not that important if it is like a thousand or two thousand dollar laptop but if it is if the data inside that that laptop gets compromised then the whole purpose of your uh of your data becomes uh, invaluable. So uh, you should have something like, as soon as you see that the stolen device comes up, it should be locked or wiped out in a fashion that it will never be able to recover them. DDoS attacks uh, or denial of services attack actually, uh, when an intruder issues a flood of broadcast pings, messages, preventing the legitimate users from accessing the normal network sources. So imagine, just imagine that you have, you have launched an attack and let's say if you have ordered, if you, have, if you are waiting for somebody to deliver an order at your doorstep, but if your doorstep is flooded with, with flock of people, how can the leg legitimate, uh, user or legitimate uh, delivery guy can deliver the packet to you or deliver your package to you it's it becomes impossible so that's why denial of services attacks occurs when the intruders issues the flood of broadcast and prevent a legitimate request from accessing the normal network so your network can go down and the, it could be due to this distributed uh, dos attack or uh, denial of service attack are orchestrated, these are orchestrated with the several sources called zombies. Uh, there are websites that can help you launch the DDoS attack. So a DDoS attack is, is, a, is a type of DDoS attack that bounced off uninfective com computer uh, called reflector before being directed. So you might you maybe, okay. So D, DRDOS attack is a kind of attack that is sitting on on the network computer, but it is targeting on uh, targeting another computer, which could which could probably be a server. But that at but that machine uh, becomes the reflector before it being uh, before uh, it launches the attack for the actual target machine. So you know you have a uh, kind of a tiger sitting behind uh, the grass impersonating and then when it comes down to the attack it will launch the attack kind of thing uh, amplified drdos attack can be amplified when conducted using a small simple request that triggers very large response from the target so you are expecting a so if the website that you are trust and that you go every day you thought that I will go today to that website and it will not, it will not, it will not launch any attack for me. But all of a sudden, uh, because that website is just recently been uh, compromised, they will send the data your way as well, and then it can trigger the large response from from the actual uh, source, and then you get swamped with that, and you will have an amplified attack as well. And then you can also become the amplified source. 
for another company when you are sending when somebody joins your company and try to web browse your website or your portal or your services permanent dos attack meaning that uh, you write something in the bios or the first sector of your hard drive so that when you when the user try to work the hardware is damaged to an extent through the um, software changes that the firmware is beyond repair of that uh, beyond, um, goes beyond repair it could be you know you will think that okay that device has is coming to an end of life or it is it is uh, it is an old device um why bother updating it but obviously when you go and upgrade that it was waiting for that to be uh, to be to have an update and once that update comes in it actually damages the whole uh, hardware itself so it becomes unrepairable when you know that uh, that uh, your data is compromised or your company is running through an uh, under attack right now uh, don't respond um, at least through your emails to inform your clients we have to call them by phone just to say that don't send any further any further emails and we will not be able to respond to you and we are not responding back to our clients because uh, currently our, we are running under cyber attack or something so you will have unintentional dos attacks so you don't want to send out unintentional uh, data to your legitimate clients and they will think why this my my vendor is sending me this malicious information so you have to first as as a first source of action just text message or page them or call them or phone them instead of sending an email email because your network is under attack and obviously your email could be in the malicious state as well So as you can see, this one is the first uh, way of attacks. So the attacker send out the sending uh, out the commands or set out their stakes at different computers on your network, not actually targeting your web server, but for they they keep setting up some zombie computers at your network because they have captured one computer. Then they will transmit it to another computer through an email or through a malicious link, and then they send it out to your almost like good part of your network. And then once it's done, they will send out the command. And the day they will send out the command, that will be a zero-day attack. Once they send out the command, it will actually flood the web server, not with just one set of commands. As you can see, there are three commands logged from each. So there are nine requests coming to the web server, and the web server gets so much blocked or overwhelmed that it's not been able to listen to your uh, actual legitimate request that is coming from another source. Some other vulnerabilities that we can see is. Uh, Little, um, for example, we can look at on path attack relies on intercepted transmission and can take several forms. Um, previously called as man in the middle attack, that's right. So you're you're sending out the data. And then somebody is sniffing at the data because they already have intercepted your uh, line and they are not disclosing themselves. They are just secretly looking at the data and the packets that you're sending intercepting that making a copies one for themselves and one for uh, sending it out and then they can they can just keep a sniffing company's data so that's sitting on the path attack or something you call in the olden days you will call it man in the middle the authentication park uh, attacks is that attackers send fake the authentication frames to the access point the the client or the, the client or both. So, for example, if you are going to the 
Facebook page or some page that you visit daily, and you think that, okay, I can go onto this website on daily basis. So they can mock another similar Facebook page, send out the email uh, or something link that uh, you have a new message on Facebook, click to log in. And once you click the login, it looks like a very similar page to Facebook. You enter your credential and you find out later on that the link, hyperlink is not showing up as a Facebook page, but it is something else, some other malicious face, uh, Facebook page. But the door is closed behind you because you have already entered the, uh, the, uh, the password and the credentials, and then you have actually exposed your credentials. The other part, the other side of it, we can look at it as another branch that I can think of it is that you have, a, you know, you have a legitimate account and you can log in, but at the same time, because of those attacks, um, they have launched due to the DDoS type of attacks. When you try to log in, you will not be, you are not able to log in and it will de authenticate you and say that you are not the legitimate user. So they might uh, block your account. That is why sometimes network administrators do like to. Uh, create uh, an account lockout scheme so that after three login attempts, it will not allow uh, the users to log in to the system. And that's the first day for it is good, but it is bad sometimes as well. That somebody on your network forget their password, they might be calling you first thing in the morning while you are driving, saying that, Hey, I'm not able to log in. Can you set it up? because they have recently changed their password and they forgot their new password. So this can happen, but this is actually not a the authentication. It is a layer that you have as a network administrator has added so that if people have are entering the wrong uh, credentials, um, they get locked out and safely locked out, locked out. And you as an administrator will lock them in, uh, lock them back in after knowing that, yeah, it was legitimately locked out because you are trying more than three or four times. Not going into the details of all the different types of risks. Uh, but here you go. You will see this in the other courses as well. Uh, and you might get bored of looking at these few more times. Uh, but this is the first time. If not, you are looking at the first time. Uh, these are a few of these uh, malicious software tech softwares that that are uh, out there in the market these days. And uh, as a cybersecurity a student, you will be brought up with these um, terms quite a quite a few times. For example, a virus we all know, but there are some other different ways of um, malicious software program that disguises itself. That is something useful, but actually it harms your system. So when you go on some website and think, okay, uh, um, I have downloaded the the software from this website before. They always have good uh, software available, but this time, after years of trust, they put some kind of a Trojan horse that program that disguises itself that it's a legitimate program. But then this time they have put a illegitimate program, and that that maybe may sneak upon your information. So it uh, the the damage is done. They they are successfully able to uh, develop the trust, then send you the software. And then you install that software and then it can cause an issue. So Trojan horse software is one of that. Warm is a program that if when it and when it has been installed on one system, it, it sneaks out from that particular system and travels from one computer to another computer and then eventually spreading it all across the network. So kind of a virus, but uh, starts with one computer and travels from one computer to another. How it travels? Possibly sometime through email communication. If you may have put the file on the network and somebody you ask somebody else to look at that same file, you don't know behind that file there's a worm sitting, and then they, when they open it, it uh, it spreads out that way. A bot is a program that automatically does it without requiring a per person 
to start or stop it. So be aware of those uh, programs. Usually the programs that are ending with uh, these extensions, for example, programs with these extensions are very harmful, could be very harmful. The programs with dot ending with the name of dot exe, dot msi, uh, dot zip. It could be some other program in heading inside that zip file. So when you are opening up any of these programs with these extensions or downloading any program, usually most of the email providers like Yahoo, Gmail, and Hotmail prevent sending these files over the emails. And for the reason, because you don't want uh, the programs to be um, emailed and somebody accidentally, because it's a very easy bait that people can fall into. Uh, so if they click on an executable file or MSI file, um, the next thing after seeing an email, they look at what's the attachment and they can accidentally click the exe file. And there you go, it has run in the background. So another program, another type of program that can run in the background is dot batch file. So batch file is a script file as well. So again, they are legitimate and they are they could be illegitimate as well, depending upon the name of the program and who who made it and who is it coming from. Ransomware, I talked about this more uh, in the start of the lecture. Until the ransom is paid. Program that locks the user data to the computer system until the ransom is paid. I'm not sure if those companies who have been hacked, if they have paid the handsome amount, have they been able to get their beta, uh, data back? I'm not sure. I haven't researched that, but there are quite a few companies that have been uh, dealt in this manner. This looks like a little bit of a screenshot of ransomware. So when you have any attacks or malwares, um, you will have certain properties to them so that they cannot easily be identified or easily be uh, rectified. So they encrypt the code sometimes, they encrypt the, uh, the message or they encrypt the program they run in the stealth mode or they disguise themselves as a legitimate program like a Trojan horse. Polymorphism and time dependent, for example, looking for a certain time to get activate like a logic bomb that if certain logic happens. But there are obviously anti-malware software available as well.